This video was sponsored by the Ancient Language Institute. To learn Latin, Ancient Greek, or Hebrew with some of the best instructors and pedagogy out there, sign up for online lessons at ancientlanguage.com. In a previous video, I told you about the vowels of the International Phonetic Alphabet. And in that video, I told you why it's so important to learn this system if you have any interest in dealing with a foreign language. And that's because we can talk about, oh yeah, the sound of E in perché of Italian is like the vowel in they in English. But this is so inaccurate as to be unhelpful. So a way to really understand what's going on in any language is to understand the International Phonetic Alphabet symbols. And so in that previous video, I explained to you how to read an IPA, International Phonetic Alphabet, vowel chart. Today, though, I want to tell you about the consonants. How are the consonants arranged in the IPA system? This is something that's been especially important to me in my personal research into the practical reconstruction of the sound of ancient Latin and Greek, the way that those languages sounded in antiquity, and indeed how they changed in their pronunciations through time. But in order to really have a discussion about these things I've discovered over the years, working with colleagues, is that if we don't actually know what these IPA symbols mean, if we are not using them the right way, or if we're using similar symbols but with different meanings, we get confused. So this is extremely helpful to access the pronunciation of ancient languages. And to that end, I want to thank my sponsor for this video, the Ancient Language Institute. Now, I've been working with ALI for years. It's a wonderful cadre of instructors teaching Latin, ancient Greek, and Hebrew, biblical, classical Hebrew, and doing it in active ways with some of the best pedagogy out there. Students can sign up for classes at the beginner, intermediate, or advanced levels, or can take courses of a different track that are specific to their interests, and also have available to them individual tutored lessons with an instructor. I know a lot of students who have actually profited a lot from being able to take a class of, say, ancient Greek, but also getting the benefit of additional instruction, whether regularly or on an as-need basis, from the same or from different instructors in the ALI cadre. If you have any interest at all in learning Latin or ancient Greek or biblical Hebrew, take a look at the lessons that they have to offer. And thanks so much to ancientlanguage.com for supporting this video. Now, let's take a look at the IPA consonant chart. Now, when you see this, you might think, oh my gosh, this is way too complicated. I'm out. And I'm going to tell you, don't go yet because I'm going to break this down and make it perfectly understandable for you. We saw this pretty complicated looking vowel chart last time, but I showed you that this is actually just a representation of the inside of the mouth. An abstraction which shows us that the places that these vowels are articulated corresponds to actual positions in the mouth. Most significantly, that vowels articulated at the front of the mouth are on the left, and the vowels that are articulated at the back of the mouth are on the right. And in just the same way, the consonant chart has the consonants articulated at the front of the mouth on the left and at the back of the mouth on the right. This chart specifically is for something called pulmonic consonants. The pulmones in Latin are the lungs. So these are consonants that come from the expulsion of air from the lungs. And you might think, well, how else can you make consonant sounds? Well, you can make them without expelling air, by just making sounds with your mouth. For example, languages that have a click sound. Ngosa is one of these languages. And Ngosa, a language in South Africa, that initial sound, I don't know if I'm doing it perfectly right for that language, but it's essentially a click sound with the tongue. Now, interestingly, these are features we have in our languages that don't usually use these phonemically. Sounds can be phonemic in a language if they're used to spell words and if they have a kind of specific clear meaning, but there are all kinds of sounds that we have in English that aren't phonemic to any of our vocabulary. One of them that I use, for example, when I call a cat, I go and that's a clicking sound. Such a sound like that could be found in words of other languages languages that use non-pulmonic 
consonants. Another one that we have in English is ooh, and that's the ooh, like the like uh, ew is another way to describe that sound. Ooh, that's something that sort of raises disgust. Well, that is a really important vowel in a lot of Slavic languages. Ooh. Let's do an overview of the major groups of consonants on this chart. We have labial or labial, either pronunciation is fine, coronal, dorsal, and laryngeal. And like previously mentioned, these are referring to the points of articulation in the mouth, labial, with the lips, labia in Latin. Coronal, the corona refers to the area from the teeth to the alveolar ridge. Then we have the dorsal area, and these include palatal or velar consonants. And then we have laryngeal ones. For example, say the sound of H in English, that H sound, H, or the ayin sound in Arabic. Unlike the standard Roman, Greek, and Cyrillic alphabets, there are some writing systems in the world that are arranged in a similar way. Here are the Devanagari of Sanskrit and Hindi and other languages in India. Here is the Hiragana chart for Japanese. And here is where I actually first learned these things from the chart of Tengwar, which is the writing system used for Elvish, created by Tolkien for his Lord of the Rings Elvish languages. As with the vowel chart, I'm not going to explain every symbol here. I'm going to be concentrating on a lot of the ones that are especially important to me for the languages that I deal with, not just Latin and ancient Greek, but also Japanese and other languages. And to really anchor our sense of what's going on, I'm going to start with the plosive row. Now, plosives can also be called occlusives. That's a synonym for plosive or stops. So plosives or occlusives or stops are just synonyms for the same thing. Let's start here on the left with the labial plosives. And the first one we have here is the sound of the letter P in English and next with the sound of the letter B. Now in this chart, we normally place the voiced variant next to the voiceless variant. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? This is actually a really important and fundamental thing to know about consonants. Many languages contrast between voiceless and voiced consonants. Some languages, though, don't have this contrast. Modern Icelandic is such a language which has a contrast of many of these consonants if they are aspirated or unaspirated, and this is also true of standard Chinese. Now, this does not mean that voicing cannot occur. It just means that it's a secondary aspect of the difference between the phonemes. So a P sound and a B sound in English, their fundamental difference is one of voicing. That is, the main difference between them is whether or not the vocal cords are vibrating when the sound is made. P, B. Those of you who are very astute about these things, though, may notice that p also is highly aspirated when it's in isolation or when it's at the beginning of a word in English or when it comes before a stressed syllable, such as in the word apparent or simply the word parent. So something that appears or a parent or a pin and so forth. In standard English, the initial p sound must be aspirated. And if it's not, it sounds foreign. For example, if I were to say, instead of pin, if I were to say bin, it almost sounds like bin. And that's because our voiced consonants, our voiced plosives in English, like b, they are not aspirated normally. And that means that if I say bin and pin, one could say that a voiceless p sound to our English ears, sounds like it's in between. That's not actually what it is. Bin is just a voiceless P sound. Ba, ba, ba. If you're interested in this, I recommend a video I've made for my Patreon supporters, which is about the reconstructed pronunciation of Latin. It's a course to train you on some of the basics of how to actually pronounce classical Latin. So see that link in the description. Since aspiration is something additional, this letter P, although it looks like our letter P, isn't actually P. It's really P and not P, because P 
would have to have a superscript H on it in order to be the actual sound of P, the aspirated P sound. So this is B and B. If you find the difference difficult, you may be a native English speaker or a native speaker of German, but this difference is absolutely essential. If you're not speaking Italian or Spanish with this in mind, if you're trying to speak Latin or ancient Greek and you're aspirating P the way that we do in English, it's simply not the way that those languages work and must be articulated differently. One must not do this aspiration. And like I said, I have a video that is in the description for Patreon supporters to teach you how to do this. Let's move inside the mouth a little bit and we get to the coronal section. And here we see a letter T and a letter D. And uh, you guess that they don't necessarily represent that the way that they are written. So these symbols could be applied to either dental or alveolar or palatal alveolar. Usually they take some kind of diacritic to describe where they are. But these are best represented as the sounds in, say, Latin or as Italian. That is ta and da. So they're not like ta and da in English. They can be if we add some diacritics to them to indicate that, oh, we mean specifically that variation, but the ta and da, unaspirated, of course, for the voiceless occlusive, is the standard meaning of these letters. So that would be how we would understand them in a narrow IPA transcription, a precise IPA transcription. Now let's go to the dorsal area. And we have two areas of interest in particular, the palate and the velum, otherwise known as the hard palate and the soft palate. So palatal consonants that are occlusives, we have two of them represented here. And these are g and g. And they may sound a lot like gya and gya, but they're not. They are articulated in the palate. Now, these don't occur in English normally, so as English speakers, we don't have to deal with them. They do, however, occur in languages like modern Greek. Say the modern Greek word for and, which is ge, ge. That is the letter C here. That's what it represents. So ge is that sound. And it's not a K plus a Y sound. Kye. It's not kye. It's ge, ge. It's actually articulated with that part of the tongue which is at the hard palate. It's a palatal consonant. It took me a while to get used to making this sound and also for the ge sound. So ke and ge. But with a little practice, you can get there too. The velar consonants are somewhat more familiar because we have the sounds of K and G in English, right? We have K and G with the caveat that, oh, it can't be K because it would have to have a superscript H. This is, in fact, G. So K and G, respectively, K, G. The uvular stuff is really fun. The letter Q, for example, which we see in transcriptions from Arabic, is, in fact, a sound that occurs in Arabic. The sound of, say, qof. Semitic languages traditionally have this q sound, as do other Afro-Asiatic languages, like ancient Egyptian, q. And we have a voice variant of it, which is q, uh, but uh, I don't think that occurs in Arabic that I can think of. Of course, there's a lot of variety in Arabic, and I'd have to find a language which has that one. Then we get to the laryngeal area, and we have the pharynx, and we have the glottis. This is the sound traditionally made by the Semitic letter Aleph, found in the Phoenician alphabet as well as Hebrew and Arabic. And to the sensibility of speakers of Western European languages, it doesn't really seem to be a thing with a phonetic value. This is a consonant. And yeah, and this is sort of the difference of what makes something phonemic or not. This is a really important phoneme in, say, Semitic languages, because it represents not making a vowel sound, and there's no transition. It's an ah sound. We do have this in English. It's just not phonemic, such as when we say ah, 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 ah. We hear it between vowels. So it's not merely a series of ah, because that, that would be ah, 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 ah. It's ah, 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 ah. And that's a really important thing that this does. The glottal stop is pretty well known, actually, because it does occur sometimes. 
in English. For example, in my normal way of pronouncing American English, I say water, and in RP, it's water. Um, but you can hear plenty of native speakers of English, especially in Britain, say water. And that is the glottal stop. It's interesting that that intervocalic T sound is lenited. It goes through lenition, becomes lanis, becomes softer, smoother, softened to something more like an intervocalic D sound in American English and to a glottal stop in many varieties of British English. Since we're at the laryngeal region and we're in the glottal column, let's talk about these two fricatives or approximants. <laughs> What's the difference between a fricative and approximate? Well, a fricative is where air is allowed to pass through. A plosive is also known as a stop because it prevents flow of air. When we make a B sound, b, b, like the, until we release the sound, there is no sound. And same with the pa, we can't just continuously make a P sound. I was trying to do it, but it didn't work. But I can continuously make an F sound like f or s or sh or h. So let's talk about that. That is a fricative. An approximate is a sound which is the same articulation point, but there is yet more space between the articulating members. So it could be the tongue or the glottis or whatever it is that's coming together. If it's approximate, it means that they're farther apart. And here they're both considered either fricatives or approximates because they're essentially the same and it's hard to tell the difference anyway. So what are these sounds? Well, the first one, which looks like a letter H, is <sighs> It's essentially the sound of breathing out, the sound of air passing through the vocal cords without the vocal cords vibrating. This is a very important consonant sound in English, such as in the word hat or he. Interestingly, there are a lot of English speakers that in front of the E vowel sound, they don't use the glottal H sound. They use this thing, the Ich laut of German. And they'll say not he, but he. It's extremely common. If you are using the Lucian pronunciation of ancient Greek, this could be a mistake you are making. You might be saying the word for hand, for example, which is hir, and that has the sh sound. The sound is also found in modern Greek, and modern Greek pronunciation would be about the same for this word, hir. And here's another Greek word, himation, himation. A lot of people, though, I've heard with this particular characteristic in their English, they will say himation, and this is incorrect. Because if we're reconstructing the ancient pronunciation, we cannot merge the sound of the rough breathing, the equivalent to the H of Latin or English, with the letter chi sound in front of front vowels. So that is a problem that um, is something you might be doing. So you want to take a clear listen to this and try to distinguish them. Maybe not in English. I mean, I distinguish them in English. Other people don't natively, and that's all fine. But in ancient Greek, definitely don't merge things, if possible, that were not merged ever in the ancient language. Similarly, Spanish speakers, using various reconstructed pronunciations of ancient Greek, will very frequently make a similar error, where they will use their native jota sound. Now, the sound of jota can sound different in different varieties of Spanish. It can sound more j, it can sound more ha, it can sound all, like, all kinds of things. However, I've heard Spanish speakers do the same thing, where they'll use the same jota sound for jimation, as well as for here, and that doesn't work. It's creating the same kind of merger, a merger which never, ever has happened in the history of the Greek language, so don't do that. Find a way not to do that. It would be better not to pronounce the rough breathing than to pronounce it the exact same way as the letter chi. Next to the basic letter H sound is a letter H that's curly at the top, and this is the voiced variant. This can occur in English speech, not phonemically, but for example, instead of saying aha, I might say aha, and there it's more voiced, aha. And this is probably the best approximation of the sound of H for a lot of situations in classical Latin, especially intervocalically. It explains very well why a word like mihi could be 
changed into me so easily. It's not wrong per se to use the true voiceless H sound to say mihi, but saying mihi allows for a lot more acoustic similarity with a long E sound, as if there's nothing there at all. So that helps to explain a lot of the spelling variations we see. Next to the glottals, we have the pharyngeals. And like I mentioned, one of them is ayn, that lovely sound in Arabic, ayn. And the voiceless variant is <gasps> And that's a really fun sound to make. Let's go to the uvular fricatives. The upside down R is the German R. And to a lesser extent, we could also say this is like the French R. So this is the R, the uvular trill. Now, if you want to pronounce German in a standard way, you need to make this R sound. Well, how do you do it? Well, just get some water and gargle and go R. Pro tip, if you make this voiceless, and round the lips, you make this a rounded, voiceless, uvular, approximate trill thing, you get the sound of a cat purring. But the true voiceless fricative variant of this is kha, kha. That's the uvular kha. And that sound can be heard in a whole bunch of languages. Let's move forward to the velar fricatives. And here we have a couple very important ones to both ancient and modern Greek. The voiceless, the one that looks like an X, is kha, kha. So this is different from kha by a lot. So kha is velar, but kha is uvular. Those are, yeah, those are different. I remember Mark Okrand talking about this important difference when describing Klingon, the language he developed for the Star Trek series. The voiced variant of ha is ga, ga. Now again, this is made in the velum. How can you figure out how to articulate this right? Well, that's why I talked about the plosives first, because the plosives give us a point to understand this. If I want to do the ha sound, then I have to start with a ka, so ka 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 ka, and then I want to lower my tongue to make a fricative sound. I'm not going to block the air entirely, such as an occlusive, a blocker, a stop would do. I don't want to stop the air. I want it to fricativize and make ha. So ga, but ha. And I have a ga, 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 and make ga, 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 ga. It's because I'm not making full contact that I'm not making a stop, and thus a fricative sound. So those two are critical for Greek. And if we move them forward, we get the other variants, variants that are in modern Greek and even occurred rather frequently in antiquity of ancient Greek, specifically in front of front vowels. So the voiceless one of the palatal fricative here, this is sh, and this is also known as the ich laut of German because the German word ich has this, which is different from the ach. Laut. Laut means sound in German. So these are linguistic terms. Ich laut and ach laut. Because ach is velar, but ich is palatal. The voiced variation is ja, ja. And this sound is not the same as the letter J that we see beneath. The letter J is used to represent the sound of German ja or of Latin ja. That's a very important consonant sound, obviously, but with this little curly cue at the bottom, it's not an approximate, it's tighter. The tongue is yet closer to the palate, so it's not ya, it's ya, ya. I'm sure you can probably hear the difference, but you might not be able to really pick it out, and the way to practice this is to listen to modern Greeks, say ya, which means hello, ya, for example, which doesn't sound like ya in German. It sounds kind of similar, but there's a both the vowels are actually quite different, as well as the consonant sounds. These are critical differences. If we have a Greek person which uses the native ya sound in German, well, they're going to have a Greek accent. They're not going to be using the German phoneme. If we have a German using the ya sound for ya instead of ya, it's going to sound German. So these differences are really, really important. I know they seem subtle, <laughs> but I promise they're really important. Let's talk about some of the nasal consonants in this group. Nasal consonants 
Also, just like the other things in these columns, they have the same relative articulation points. But instead of being oral, they are nasal sounds. So instead of the mouth being open, instead of air passing through the mouth, it passes through the nostrils. So, for example, the sound of M is mmm. So that's the sound of mmm, ma, ma, ma. So if we make the sound continuously, mmm, the lips are closed, and that's what makes mmm. Now it's the sound of the N, mmm, 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 mmm. Interestingly, it's usually possible, with a little practice, even through this microphone, for you to be able to hear the difference between the dental or alveolar mmm sound and the bilabial mmm sound. They sound a little bit different, and I think that's really fascinating because the mouth is opening, but the air isn't even passing through it, and yet we can hear the articulated difference. It's fascinating the, the resonance qualities of our various sound articulators. The palatal nasal, ny, such as in the English word canyon, uh, this is the end with a tilde over it in Spanish words like año, and it's a critical sound in Italian, usually represented by GN, like campagna, or by gnocchi, or by lasagna. Note that the sound ny in Italian is geminated. It's always held for about twice as long as other single consonants. So that's a really important aspect. It's not campagna, it's campagna. The velar nasal is represented often in English by final NG, such as in king or sing, and it also occurs frequently in languages any time the letter N is placed in front of the velar plosives, for example, such as in angelus in Latin, angelus. One interesting Indo-European exception I can think of is that Russian, if we see a letter N in front of a velar, it doesn't velarize. So something like Italian anke, which means also, with a Russian accent would be anke, anke. We have a distinct dental sound to the nasal and then a uh, distinct velar sound. They don't, uh, they don't assimilate to each other. I find that very interesting. Retroflex consonants are super cool. These are found, for example, in the languages of India. Not all of them, but many of them. So take the nasal, na, 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 na. The plosives, da and da, and fricatives, sha, ja, and so forth. These are really cool sounds. How do you make them? You put the tip of the tongue, retroflex. You flex it retro, flex it back, retro. So the tip of the tongue is approaching the palate of the inside of the mouth. So, so, you bring the, so if you do this, actually, you end up getting readily the elements to create a stereotypical accent of someone from India depending on where they're from, of course. Like I said, this is a stereotype. But but if I bring my, the tip of my tongue to the roof of my mouth and I try to make every sound from it, it sounds kind of like that accent, right? And I'm not trying to make fun of that, that accent at all. I'm just trying to demonstrate what happens when you bring the tip of the tongue to that part of the mouth. So if I keep the tip of my tongue for the, all of the words that I try to say, it just sounds like that. It sounds retroflex. There are a lot of really important retroflex consonants. There are four retroflex plosives in Sanskrit and Hindi, for example. So that's one reason why that those really cool and beautiful sounds often occur in such accents, stereotypical though they might be, especially in my simplistic representation of them just a moment ago. In the coronal area, we have different kinds of fricatives, and they're all so cool. We actually have all six of these in English. So the letter theta from Greek is used to represent the th sound, which is appropriate because thalassa is that word that's used in modern Greek, so that works just fine. Next to it is the eth letter, and this is the voiced sound, such as in this or that, or in the way that I say thank you and thanks. Standard English varieties around the world will say that the pronunciation of the word is thanks, th voiceless, such as in thesis. In other words, that we usually get from Greek and English keep the voiceless version. But the other th version can be voiced like this or these, and I say thanks. I don't say evasion, I say avoision. In my smattering of research about this over the years, I found that 
people who say thanks instead of thanks can be found all over the world. So it's not geographical. It's not an American accent thing, though uh, there are people that you can find in America certainly that do that, as well as in the UK and in Australia. And that's really interesting. And I don't have a clear explanation for it. It might be etymological. It might be innovative. Wherever it comes from, it's so common as for me not to feel like I need to change that part of my speech. I can say thanks, but I like saying thanks. My mother says thanks, but my father says thanks. Uh, My sister says thanks, and her children say thanks, but uh, my sister's husband says thanks, voiceless. So how this voice thing happens, I'm assuming because that word is learned so early, perhaps from the mother potentially, for example, That at least in this situation, from my, you know, just sort of anecdotal observation, it seems like that word can be transmitted with a voice pronunciation and kind of stay under the radar. Like, people usually don't even notice that I say thanks until I point it out, or unless someone has a really good linguistic ear and they might notice it. So I think it's really interesting. If you say thanks with a voice sound instead of thanks, or if you know other people who do the voice one, let me know. My anecdotal observation is it's like five to... 10% of the English speaking population, which mostly comes from just, you know, listening to whoever I've ever met and also to actors on TV. And uh, so I I don't really have (laughs) any statistical data for that, but um, that would be really interesting as a study. So the dental fricatives are th and th. The alveolar fricatives are s and z. And I've talked pretty often about the variant that is apical or retracted, making these sa or za, the sound that they would have in Latin and ancient Greek, as they do in modern Greek. Behind that, the palato-alveolar fricatives, sh and j. We have two important R sounds here. The one that looks like a regular R, this is r. This is the trilled sound, r. And this occurs initially in Spanish and Italian, for example, Roma. But intervocalically, we get the one that is just the tap or the flap. For example, ara, an altar, ara. That's actually a Latin word, but you get the idea. Initially, though, da can happen in Japanese, which is why Japanese can sound kind of uh, fun and unusual. Japanese pronounces the city of Rome as doma, doma, and it's the same sound as in ara or in other words where the r is intervocalic. Underneath it, we get to the lateral approximant and we get la, 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 la. So that is the l sound. Now it's not la because that would have to be modified with some diacritics. La, uh, that's a more velarized l sound, but la, la, the bright l of British English like in the word light, um, or the la of Italian and Spanish and so forth, is this letter. The labiodental or labiodental fricatives are f and v. Now, if you speak English, uh, which is great because you're listening to this, you probably do, um, then labial dental, labiodental sound, we have contact with the lower lip and the upper teeth. F, and we also have v, the voiced variant of it. There exists an approximate sound, and this is where, what's an approximate? It's like a fricative, but there's more space, so it's v, 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 and the sound occurs in certain varieties of Dutch and also Hindi. So this also can explain sometimes why one can hear something that sounds like ma, like wa in, in certain examples of an Indian word, but it sounds like v other times, and that's because it's a consonant sound that's in between and that the vowels end up making it sound more like an more like a V sound or more like a W sound. W, by the way, could be put in the bilabial one, but uh, it's um, it also velarized. It's something more like this velar approximate, but labialized. So it's sort of two things at the same time. Again, this is the simple consonant chart. A couple of my favorite fricatives are these, represented by these Greek letters. The Greek letter phi, representing pha, the bilabial fricative, which is found in the transition of um, classical Greek into Koine and uh, later modern Greek. And I 
incorporate this into my Lucian pronunciation of ancient Greek. So this is also the same sound found uh, in Japanese, represented in Japanese transcriptions by an F normally, like Mount Fuji is Fuji, Fuji. The voiced version of it, represented by the Greek letter beta, this is va, va, va. It took me a while to get used to making these, but you can do them too. You definitely need to do them if you're going to use the Lucian pronunciation of ancient Greek, which of course I broadly recommend and uh, do all of my ancient Greek recordings in that pronunciation normally. And it's simply, you just don't use any teeth. Just keep the teeth from being in there and make a bilabial f and v. One trick you can do is to really push your lower lip forward and you can like look in a mirror and then make sure the lower lip is not contacting the teeth. So you're not saying f or v, but you're saying f and v. And that's one way to get used to that. So now, having watched this video about IPA consonants, along with the previous video about IPA vowels, you can get an overview of what any language's phonology is doing. So I hope you found this interesting, and thanks again so much to ALI for supporting this video. Check them out at ancientlanguage.com. And thank you, as always, most of all, to my Patreon supporters. Walete. To that end, I want to thank, and thanks, and thank you, 